being here. We could save on seats, couldn't we? <laughs> All right. You know, we used to joke that this was the church of the late arrival. I hope that's not true. But uh, I want to open this morning with a passage from John. Okay, this is John 13, 34 and 35. Put this in the back of your mind and remember this. So now, this is Jesus speaking. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Okay? Maybe you know that famous song, They'll Know We Are Christians By Our Love. Okay? That's the idea behind that. So... Uh, I'm so pleased that we're going to hear from Michael Silva from Senthi Church. I know. I love hearing Michael speak with us. And uh, I'm sure it's going to be a moving message. Why don't you rise and I'll say a quick word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this gorgeous morning, Lord. Thank you for this faithful congregation. Lord, let us be faithful to you and to each other, Lord, as we strive to love each other as you love us, which is unconditionally, Lord, uh, without fail. Doesn't matter how long it's been, without shame, full of grace. Lord, thank you for that. You've proven it so many ways. But most of all, you proved it by going to the cross for us. Thank you, Lord. I ask that you take Michael's message this morning, Lord, and you make it yours, and you speak to us through him. Thank you, Lord. I ask that you receive this offering of our songs, of our prayers, of the message itself, Lord that you would receive that and it would be pleasing to you like incense. Lord, be with us now. Open our hearts, our minds, and our mouths as we sing these songs to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. 
This is a song we haven't sung for a while. You may not know it, but it's an easy one. It's about dwelling in the house of the Lord. You set me apart, gave me a new heart, filled with compassion to share your great love. Show me your ways, I want to know you, guide me in truth. be seated. As we prepare for communion. Oh, I worship. 
Into it, I was singing a wrong chorus. Sorry. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning, well, Barry. Welcome to the Lord's Day. Yeah. So it's, lately, I've been doing my devotions through the Book of Psalms, and that, um, and, and it's a devotion called Promises of the Psalms. And of course, we always land on Psalm 23 at some point, right? So. Yeah, so just as a quick uh, advertising, when we start our class in May, we're going to be looking at some of our favorite psalms. So you want to join us not next Sunday, but the following Sunday. But a little advertisement. But I wanted to read the 23rd psalm. You guys all know it. I mean that. You can read it with me. And then I wanted to share a thought there about the promise and the hope of, of Psalm 23. So if you know it, say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou didst prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So those are comforting words, aren't they? Those are probably words that we often turn to when... We're struggling. Things aren't going well. And we need to remember that God is our shepherd. And that you have those moments. Is this one of your go-to psalms? So but I wanted to bring an idea out. One of the things that encouraged me this week is when we go through difficult times. You know, he says, you know, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God is with us. And to me, that's a great comfort to know that God is with us even in those shadowy, dark times. He's with us all the time, obviously. But that's where we need to know, see it and know it the most. But one of the thoughts that hit me this week as I was thinking about communion was Jesus also walked through the valley of the shadow of death, didn't he? But he had to do it alone. He wasn't, no one was with him. All everybody had abandoned him before the cross. And so he walked through that valley of the shadow of death alone so that we don't have to be alone when we do it. His walk to the cross allowed us to have access to the presence of God all the time. And that, to me, that was a neat promise to think about as I read Psalm 23. 
is that Jesus did that walk to the cross for us so that we don't have to. And that is an amazing gift that we'll never be able to repay, but we can enjoy every day, can't we? So I want you to think about that. What are the, you know, what's the struggles you've got this week? But be thankful to God that he sent his son to, to walk to the cross so that we don't have to do that. We don't have to be alone today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you loved us enough to send your son, um, not only to live, to be a living human example for us to follow, um, but you asked your son to walk to the cross and suffer the agony of the cross for us. He walked through that valley of the shadow, literally the valley of the shadow of death for us so that we now can do it, walk through difficult times. You are with us. You are guiding us. You care for us as a shepherd. Help us to hold on to your hand as we walk, to listen to your voice as we go. We need that every day. Thank you, Father, that you gave us that great gift of your son, Jesus. We remember that in our time of communion. And we pray in the name of, precious name of Jesus. Amen. So if you have your elements, on that night Jesus was betrayed. Before he did that walk to the cross, he took bread and broke it and passed it among his disciples. He gave thanks and said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. darn containers they get you <laughs> I'll wait for a second and get caught up there we go and in the same way Jesus took the cup after giving thanks and blessing it he passed it among them and said take and drink of this cup this is the new covenant in my blood for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again for us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And on, and on that day when my strength is failing we draws near time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forever more sing like never before oh my soul I worship your holy name I worship your now, our brother Michael Silva. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Wow. I thought it was cold. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. That just made me feel like I need a rug in the morning. It is on. It's just that it's far. It's far from well, good morning, First Christian Church, brothers and sisters. I am happy to be here with you guys today. Um, I'm actually more happy to share what the Lord has for us. And um, I'm pretty sure in the announcements you saw that uh, we're going to preach on the same verses that uh, Darren preached last week. But this is the beauty of it, uh, that we may preach on the same verses but the Lord allows us to see different things. And that is the beauty of the word of God, you know. Um, it's the Holy Spirit that dwells in us that leads us to, to, you know, to these beautiful messages that he has for us. And that means that the word of God is alive. It's not just any book 
that you pick up from a library and okay, yeah, whatever, you know, it, it, it speaks to us. So we must open our hearts, we must open our minds, and we must have a willing heart to receive this word. Um, keep it in our hearts, keep it in our minds, but most of all, a, a willing heart to apply the word of God. Because we do nothing if we receive it and we don't act on it. And we just, we just came, fill the chair, and that's it. It's obeying the word of God that changes our lives, that changes our mentality, that changes our hearts, that changes everything around us. And, if, and even if the, the circumstances doesn't change, our hearts are changing according to the word. So uh, today we're going to preach about growing. As, as a Christian, we must grow constantly. Many of you have kids, grandsons, and at the moment that you were pregnant, you, you knew that you were pregnant, I don't, I don't know if you remember that, something started growing in you. You cannot say I'm pregnant and there's nine months later, your stomach is still flat. You'd be like, I don't think there's no life in you at this moment. So it's a Christian. So it's a person that calls himself a Christian I am a Christian. I am a believer of Christ. I am in Christ. I believe in him as my Lord and Savior. I came to him in repentance, and I live my life now by faith in Christ. Then there has to be growing. You cannot say I'm a Christian and still be stuck in the same mentality, same attitudes, same emotions, same um, um, pers um, behavior. There's no way. Because if you are a newborn, you have to be growing. But pastor, I've been coming to this church for 30 years. Yeah, you've just been congregating in this church, in a Christian church. But that doesn't make you a Christian. And the fruit that you know that you, uh, that, that you are a Christian is that you're growing constantly. Have you seen the lake waters? It's stable. It doesn't move. Have you seen the river's waters? It never stops. It's always flowing. That is the life of a Christian. The spirit that dwells in you and in me constantly is moving in us, in our personal life, in our minds, in our hearts, so in every aspect of our life. So we're going to talk about three things, growing in love, commitment, and service. Uh, and I want to tell you something very personal as an introduction. In July 21st, I will be 40 years old. Yeah, I already went through my crisis. <laughs> I already went through my crisis. It wasn't good, you know. But, um, but I remember, you know, um, one person asking me, uh, this guy, he's 36, but he looks older than me. And he's like, hey, pastor. Uh, don't you, aren't you afraid that you're going to be 40? And I said, you know what? No. I actually thank the Lord for he has blessed me with life. You know? And also, it makes me think about the times that I have failed God, which is many times. The times that I failed him, I, I, I feel bad. And, and I wonder one thing. I wonder if I really love him. In my almost 40 years of life, I've been a Christian for 21 years. I've been walking with Christ for 21 years. I've realized that I have failed him so many times. I've denied him so many times. My love for Christ has failed him so many times. And I realize that I'm not worthy of his love. So I wonder, how is it possible that I continue in his ways? How is it possible that I still desire to obey his commandments? How is it possible that I still yearn for his coming? And how is it possible that I continue to be a shepherd of his sheep? Because as a pastor, I also have failed him many times. I realize that it's not me. But it's his love. His commitment on the cross that seal me with his blood. It's his Holy Spirit 
who's given me the strength that I needed all these 21 years, that lift me up, sustain me, sustain me, and affirm me more and more, not in a religion or in a building, but in his love. And yet, my brothers and sisters, in the middle of all that failure, I have grown. Because the one that produces in me the growing is God himself. I have grown. My fears have led me to seek for his love. And it has been his power that has given me the grace to grow in being a servant like Christ. Just a little bit like Christ. Because I, I don't think I'll ever be like him. But just a little bit like Christ. I'm almost 40 years. I realize that I'm not worthy of his love. But like I said, after walking with him and failing, I only hear his voice searching for me at all times. His love calling me at all times. His sweet and loving eyes looking at me and asking me one thing. Since Christ, came, since Christ came to me when I was a 16-year-old teenager, he's been saying to me and continues saying to me, Michael, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And I can only say to him what Peter said to him. Lord, you know all things. Let's see what happened between the Lord and Peter after Peter denied Jesus. He wasn't humble enough to say, you know what, Lord? You are God. <laughs> you know all things. But Peter filled, himself, filled his heart with himself. I will never deny you. Even if this deny you, I will never deny you. I will never do such thing. And he even cursed the day he met Jesus. How many times have we done that? When you rather be somewhere else than be here on a Sunday in the day of the Lord, we're denying Christ. When you rather spend your time on your phone, on the news or TV, instead of praying, reading, we're denying the Lord. When you're supposed to testify about Christ, you're testifying about all the things, we're denying the Lord. So we can relate ourselves to Peter. Lord, we have denied. But let's see what happened in John 15, 15 to 17. I was doing the sermon. I know, I know in the notes it says 15 to 21, I think. But as I was working in the sermon, I think 15, 16, and 17 was more than enough. <laughs> Three verses was more than enough uh, for the Lord. Because if I do the other verses, it was going to be another 10 pages. And, <laughs> and I don't think you want me here for like a whole hour and a half, you know. <laughs> but let's see what Jesus, the conversation that Jesus has with, had with Peter. Um, after Peter denied him, he says, uh, Jesus came to him and he said, Now when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than this? He said to him, Yes, Lord. Now, he's still filled with himself. Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter again said, he's still not picking it up. He says, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd, my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter finally got it. Peter was hurt because he said to him the third time, wait, Jesus is questioning my love for him? He knows that I love him. And I know that I love him. And I pride myself in the fact that I love Jesus. But Peter got hurt. He got sad. He said, do you love me? Then Peter humbled himself and said, 
Lord, you know all things. What is he saying to him? You're God. I'm just a sinner whose love has failed you. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him again, tend my sheep. Notice one thing. Jesus didn't ask Peter, why didn't you do the things I asked you to do, Peter? Why didn't you listen to me when I told you that you were going to deny me? Why didn't you love me in the moments when I most needed your prayers? Your love and your commitment. Jesus is not saying to Peter, Peter, son of Jonah, why didn't you take care of your brothers at the time of the crucifixion? Why didn't you take care of my people at the time when they needed you the most? Jesus did not ask him any of these things. And the reason is because Peter himself knew that his love had failed Christ at that moment. His commitment was broken, and he was not the servant at the time that Christ needed a servant by caring for his own. Peter knew what he had to do, but his love failed. Many of us know what we have to do for Christ, but yet we fail. Jesus knew that Peter loved him. But what is Jesus aiming? What Jesus wants to make Peter see is that he called him out of off the boat, chosen among many men, so that Peter can love. Christ, so that Peter can love Jesus. So that Peter can love Christ Jesus with all his mind, strength, and heart. Jesus called Peter to love him above all things, above his failures and denial, even in those moments. And it was that love that led Peter to leave his boat and his business so that he can become a fisher. Of men. Remember that moment in Matthew 4, in verses 18 to 22, where it says, Now Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Now, those guys that were cold, are not the same guy in John 21. It's been three years. A lot has changed in these guys since this moment. Much has changed in three years. These guys immediately left everything. And I'm pretty sure they encountered themselves with something they were not expecting. But yet they still remain there. What kept them coming to Christ? What kept them there for three years? It was the love of Christ with them, in them. It was the way Christ was loving them. They left everything. Going In verse 21, going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. These are the sons of thunders, John and James. But then we hear John speaking like a loving father <laughs> in the Gospel of John and in the letters of John. A lot changed in these guys. Just like a lot changed in Peter. Yes, Peter loved Jesus. And you know how we know that Peter loved Jesus? Because he heard him when he fell to Christ and his brothers. The love for Jesus led him to cry bitterly. Because when you love and you fail, it hurts. And it hurts bitterly. In Luke 22, 61 says, to 62 it says, And then the Lord turned and looked at Peter after he denied him three times. 
And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So yes, Peter loved Christ. Yes, like you and I, we love him. Christ knew that Peter loved him to the point that he would die for him and the gospel. This shows us that Peter grew in his love for Jesus and understood that Jesus was aiming at Peter's heart, not Peter's works or word. And what Jesus is asking of each and every one of us today, 2,000 years later, he is not asking for our works. The agenda you have for Christ, it might be a busy agenda. He asks for a number of things. He's not asking for a number of things to do or a to-do list. Of course not. He's commanding Peter to love him. Just like he's commanding us to love him. To love his word, his commitment, his gospel. How did you feel when Barry was reciting Psalms 23? Your heart filled with love, hope, strength, and desire to keep going. Even though we fell to Christ this week. It's his love that keeps calling us. How much have you grown in the love for Christ and in the love of Christ? What do I mean by these two things? It's two different things. The love of Christ is knowing and understanding and experiencing how much Christ loved you and loved me to the point that he willingly went to the cross and suffered the most brutal death anybody could go through. Have you seen the people dying of cancer? It's, it's, it's tough. I seen a person, one person, um, that I was shepherding like four years ago, and it was time to go for this brother. And when I went to see him, his eyes were closed, his mouth was open, and he was just, you know, it was shocking to me. I never seen a person dying of cancer before. But you can't compare that to the way our Lord died. He was torn apart. How much have you grown in that, in that expression of love towards you? Do you still seeking for a man to love you and show you that you are valuable? Do you still seeking for a woman to show you how valuable you are? Christ is enough. I'm, I'm almost three years married. And I realized that my wife love is a blessing, but it, it, it doesn't fulfill me to, to its fullness. And I realize she, she, can't, she can't feel what you, what you, Lord, filled in my heart. It's not fair for her. It's not fair for my wife to be like, hey, you have to feel my needs, all of them. She is not God. And it's not fair for me to feel, fulfill all her needs, for I am not God. So we both have the necessity to seek for who? Christ's love. And it's in that love that I grow in loving my wife the way Christ loved me. It's in that love that I grow to commit my life to my wife every single day. And it's that love in Christ in me that leads me to serve my wife the way Christ served me. So it is in that love and how much Christ has loved us that he made us his children. That is growing in the love of Christ, knowing how much he loves us. When I'm teaching the kids on Fridays, we're going through the Gospel of John on Fridays in the youth ministry, and I'm teaching them, listen, guys, you need to understand that God, the creator of all the, of all the universe, he came down. And the Son, the Son came to us, and he became flesh. God came to us to look out for us, to search for us, to seek for the lost one, and brought good news to us. 
God is with us now, Emmanuel. Understand these guys, and they don't understand it. Not all of them. Alice, Nidele is here. She's part of the youth ministry. Alice, I know she understands this. She's growing in the love of Christ. But I still have some other kids that their minds is, they want to have a girlfriend. They want to have friends because they're seeking for that love. And they're not understanding that they are loved. Not only teenagers. I have a 25-year-old guy who's like, dying to, for a girl to, like, look at him and love him. And I'm like, my brother, listen, Christ is enough. Let God bring you a wife. But Christ is enough. Because they're, they're new. They, they just started coming to church, like, a month or two. Um, but they have to grow in the love of Christ, understanding how much Christ loves them. To the point that even though we were sinners, Christ died. For us. Do you understand that love? I understand that we're never going to be able to understand it to its fullness. But you have to grow in this understanding. Experiencing this love. And at every moment of your life. Now, growing in the love for Christ is a whole different thing. But it's the love of Christ in you that's going to lead you to grow in the love for Christ. So my question is. How much are you, have you grown in the love of Christ and in the love? And how much is that love I let you to grow in the love for him? John 14, 15 says, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. See what Jesus is trying to tell us today? He's not saying, obey my commandments and then love me. He's saying, love me first. And your love for me will be shown in how you keep my commandments. Now, I understand that you're going to fail, that you're not going to be able to fulfill them to its fullness. But it's my love in you and your love for me that's going to get you back up so that you can continue obeying my commandments. Let's see what other things says Jesus says about love, loving him. John 14, 21, 23 says, The one who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who is a true religious Christian. Is a true religious man or woman. No. The one that keeps my commandments, hears them and keeps them, is the one who loves me. And this is the beautiful thing about it, that if we love Jesus, he says, and the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. So now it's not only the Son that's loving us, and it's because we love the Son and the Son loves us, the Father also loves us. So if you're lacking of love, you need to grow in the love of Christ and in the love of the Father for you. We're very loved. Much love. And I will love him and will reveal myself to him. Judas, not the traitor, said to him, Lord, what has happened that you are going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will follow my word. And my father will love him. And, he will, we, and we will come to him and make our, our dwelling with him. This is beautiful. So we can see Jesus is more interested in our hearts that we love him. He is not aiming towards our works or what we do for the name of Jesus. Listen, unconverted people can do a lot of things in the name of Jesus. For the name of Jesus. But you and I, we know that when they present themselves in front of Christ that day of judgment... Jesus will say to them, depart from me, for I do not know you. Unconverted people can do a lot of works for Christ in the name of Christ. But Jesus is not asking for that. Many believe that they are Christians because of the things they do for Jesus. 
But we are Christians because of the love that the Spirit of God produces in us so that we love God and Jesus. And it is the love that produces the Holy Spirit in us that will lead us to do the things that Jesus demands of each and every one of us. So it's the other way around. Um, I, I listen a lot to um, Islam, not because I want to become a Muslim. I can never become a Muslim because it, it doesn't make sense, honestly. But I was listening to this um, short video of this iman, that's their pastors or teachers, and um, he said, I went to the Bible, and he said, and I saw that Jesus died for the sins of, for the sinners, the innocent dying for the guilty. And he says, it didn't make sense to me. I went to Buddhism and read about it, and it didn't make sense to me. I went to Hinduism, and it didn't make sense to me. I went to Islam, and it made sense to me. And I was like, dude, you just confirming 1 Corinthians 1, verses 19 to 23. The Jews are seeking for signs, wonders. The Greeks are seeking for knowledge, but we preach Christ crucified in Christ alone. You, you, you cannot put God in, in, in this little mind, because if you put mind in this, a God in this little mind, then he's no longer God. He's looking for the things that make sense. We're looking for the things that make sense for us. Well, since I'm doing these things, that means I'm a Christian. But God, Christ is saying, if you love me, love me first, love me first, grow in the love for me, grow in, the, in loving me, grow in understanding how much I love you, how much you are loved, that none of the angels are called children of God. This is how much I love you guys. And then coming to church on Sunday as a commandment because the, the Bible commands us to congregate in Hebrews 11. And then congregating will not be, oh, my God, I have to go to church again. For 30 years, 40 years, 20 years, I've been doing this. I got to listen to John, messing up the song, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it will be totally different. I can't wait for Sunday. I can't wait to be with my brothers and sisters. I can't wait to come to sanctuary and praise and worship and listen to the word of God. I can't wait to, to go to my Bible study because I want to grow in loving the word of Christ. How much have you grown? Jesus is aiming for that. Because when you love Christ and you love and his love dwells in you, his commandments are not a burden. Me and my wife, we finished uh, uh, reading Psalms 119. We loved it. Because in the Psalms, express, he always expressing himself, uh, the wicked are doing bad things, but I delight myself in your commandments. I love your commandments. I dwell in your commandments. I desire your commandments. I mean, clearly, this guy loved God. How much do you love him? How many of you, oh my God, again, John 15? I mean, John 21, 15 to 23? Didn't we just heard that last Sunday? Or, wait. Again? There's more? Like what Darren taught us on last Sunday is not enough? There's more? Oh, I want to hear this. I want to hear what God has to say, what Jesus has to say. Jesus is not aiming for our works. He's aiming for our hearts. And it's the Spirit of God that produces that in us. The Spirit of God produces in us so that we can love God and Jesus. And it is that, and it is that love that will lead us to do the things that Jesus is demanding of each and every one of us. Because our hearts will not be in the works, but in whom we love. In whom we do works because we love Jesus. We keep his word in our hearts because we love him. 
We keep his word in our mind, hearts, and soul because we love him. We obey his commandment because we love him. And we are loved by the Father because we love the Son. I know we have failed Christ many times, like Peter did. Peter did. Some of us has done worse than Peter. But it is the love of Christ for us, the sinners, that keeps bringing us to his feet, to his word, to his commandments. It is the love of Christ in us that keeps dragging us to this church every Sunday. And it's the same love that leads our hearts to love this church as a congregation, as members of the body of Christ, as brothers and sisters in Jesus. Heck, it's even the love of Christ that leads us to love these four walls in the building. The elders know how jealous I am of the building. Really. I have expressed to them, like, hey, you know, the carpet. You see something on the floor, do you pick it up? Or do you just pass by? We have a lot of kids in our ministry. And this, this little girl in particular, she was eating chips. And there was a bag of chips on the, on the foyer next to her. And they're like, hey, um, you mind picking that up? Oh, that's not mine. She's like six or seven. Oh, that's not mine. They didn't do that. And I went down to her. And I said, yes, I know it's not yours. But this is your house. These are your brothers. You must keep your house clean. I know it's not yours. But you know what? Someone died for your mistakes, and it wasn't his. So she looked at me, and she picked it up and threw it away. And then the next Sunday, same thing again. And she's probably going to do it again. But we're teaching her to love his family, to love the church, and to love the building. Because this is our place where we congregate. It's the love of Christ that's going to lead you to love this, not idolize it, okay? But when you love Christ, you love everything about him. It pushes us to love everything about him. And it's even the love of Christ that pushes us to love the lost ones. Listen, I don't know if you guys are going to have me here again, but we went out to give out flyers for Easter. And only John, the two Johns. Did you come, John? I don't remember seeing you. John, Larry, Barry, and Gary showed up from this congregation. Where is your love for the the lost ones? Now, I understand you might have a lot of situations, right? But in your limitation, how much can you do for the lost ones, for your friends? Listen, we ha- we're celebrating Easter's, Easter Sunday. We're inviting you. We need to grow in the love for the lost one. I love you guys. And because I love you, I got to say these things, you know? I don't say it to make you feel bad. I say it to make you question your love for the lost ones. You know? Because it is the love of Christ that even will push us, push us to love the lost ones, those who have not heard the gospel, the good news of repentance and faith. And it is the love of Christ in us that leads me and leads you to grow in something amazing called commitment. Commitment to Christ and his church. And it's the love of Christ in us that must lead you and me to want to serve the Lord, your Savior, our King. It's this amazing love in us that moves us to serve one another the way he served us. And by serving one another, we show that we love him and we obey his commandments. According to John 13, 34 to 35, I am giving you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you, 
that you also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, I know the American culture is completely different than the Spanish culture, but the gospel is the same. And the gospel does not adjust according to the culture. It is us that we must adjust our life according to the gospel. How many of you have covered your brothers that haven't showed up to church in the past Sundays? How many of us were concerned about, um, oh, my God, I forgot his name. He used to sit over there. Steve. Steve. He was in bad shape. Now, you might say, well, that's the, that's the elder's job. No. It's the congregation's job. Say what? Yeah. That was the opportunity to show that we love one another the way Jesus has loved, lo- loved us. Just put in an example. How many of us, have you called your brothers and sisters that haven't been to church in a while? Hey, we haven't seen you on Sunday. But pastor, we, 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 we're not like the Spanish church. I'm saying we're like the gospel It's the gospel in us that leads us to do these things. It's not a cultural thing. Because we have that in the Spanish church, too. Everybody's into their own business. (laughs) But we have this kid in the youth ministry. He hasn't come to meeting in two Fridays. And we play soccer on Saturdays at 5. And all these kids show up. And he he didn't come this yesterday. He didn't come to the game. And he loved football. I mean, soccer. And... So I had the boys, the kids, you know, and I'm like, hey, what happened to this kid? And they're like, I don't know, man. You got to give him a call. And I'm like, yes, but he's your brother, too. You have to text him. You have to call him. You have to let him know, hey, where you been? We miss you because we love him. And in this, we show that we are his disciples. And as his disciple, we must have an attitude, according to Philippians 2, 5a. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, has he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Don't grasp into your pride. Don't grasp into your pr- uh, fear. Oh, but I don't know if they're going to like me to call them and, or at least send them a text. Don't worry about it. Do what you have to do and let God do the rest. But empty him himself by taking the form of a bond servant and being born in the likeness of men and being found, found in an appearance as men, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of dead, dead on a cross. My brothers, how much have you grown in the love of Christ, of Christ and for Christ? Because it is the love of Christ in you that will lead you to love everything about Christ. It is the love that will lead you to growth in discipleship. Do not forget that you and I were called to be his disciples, not his bodies, his disciples. And as disciples, we must imitate our teacher in everything. It is the love that will lead you to commit your life to the Lord Jesus, to everything he loves, his church, his gospel, lost one, and your brothers at FCC. And it's the love that will lead you to grow in the desire to serve Christ, his kingdom, his church, your brothers, your family, and the lost one. And it's the love that in the end glorifies Christ. Because in this we demonstrate that we are his disciples. When we love each other like he loves us. Loved us and will love us eternally. My brothers and sisters, look into your heart and the years of your life and your walk with Christ and ask yourself, have I grown in these three things, love, commitment, and service? Or do I only look out for myself and my pride? Look into yourself and ask, have I grown in commitment? Or am I only committed to myself and my personal desires? And ask yourself one last question. How much have I grown in service for Christ? Or do I just want to be served? And if the Spirit of God lets you see that you need to grow in these three things, remember that God has given you a new heart.
according to Ezekiel 36, 25 to 26. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and bring, out, and bring it about that you walk in my statutes and are careful and follow my ordinances. Don't forget that he poured out all his love in that new heart that he's given you with the Holy Spirit that he gave us so that we can love him the way he loved us. According to Romans 5.5, 5, one of my favorite verses says, And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So if you have the Holy Spirit, and I have the Holy Spirit, the love of God dwells in us, the love of Christ, the love for Christ, for his commandment, and that love will lead us to commit and serve. So pray to the Lord. Confess your sins and humble your heart and say to him, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. For I have not loved you with all, all of me. And I have not committed my life to, your, to, your, to you the way you gave yourself to save me. And I have not served the same way you showed me in your word to serve. Please produce in me by your Holy Spirit that dwells in me to love you more and more. Especially when I fail you. Run to your love. Produce in me by your Holy Spirit that desire to surrender and commit my life to you and serve. Because it is the only way I can love my family, my brothers at FCC, and the lost one. And only by your power I can grow in committing my life to you. Produce in me the grow to serve you and serve my family, my church, my brothers and sisters, and the lost ones. Please, Lord, produce in me these things because I can't do it on my own. According to Philippians 2.13, for it is God who is at work in us, both the desire and the work for his good pleasure. So today, if Jesus was here, today Jesus asked you, Christians of FCC, do you love me? And pray for this church and its members, its elders. Again, if the Lord Jesus asks you today, Christians of FCC, do you love me? Then work for this church. Serve this church. Love this church. Commit to this church. Again, if the Lord Jesus asks you today, Christians of FCC, do you love me? Then love this church, its members, elders, even its walls. And if the Lord Jesus asks you a final time, Christians of FCC, do you love me? then commit to grow individually and as one, as a church, and in numbers to serve one another. Especially in numbers. We're not done here. FCC is not done. Remember what God asked Ezekiel, son of man, can these dry bones live again? There's still a lot of work, people. Jesus hasn't come yet, and you guys are still here. I mean, he hasn't called you yet. So your job is not done yet. It's not only the elder's job to make sure this church grows. It's in each and every one of us. Commit to grow individually and in numbers to serve one another. In this way, FCC will show that you are true disciples of Christ, According to John 13, 35, by this, all men will, now, will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Amen? Let's meditate in these three things. Lord, I want to grow in loving you more. I want to grow in, my, in committing my life to Christ and to serve. Now, you may say, but I have limitations. He knows, and we know, but tell him. These are my limitations, but you're greater than this. Just show me how to do it. Because I love you. And I love my church. And I love my members and my family. Amen? Let's pray. Oh, Father. 
how much you loved us. We can't even imagine. But we know that you love us. Because even though we were sinners, you died for us. You gave your life for us. And you commit yourself to sacrifice yourself to save us. And, you, and you, when you were here, you served us. Please help us grow. We recognize that we probably haven't grown much in these things, but we desire these things. We have failed like Peter did in all these years of walking with you. But it's your love that keeps dragging us to come to you. Please help us. Let your Holy Spirit produce the growing in us for your love and loving you more so that we can grow in the love of Christ, his word, and my brothers and sisters in this place. And I want to commit myself to you more and more to be with you, to be with your word, to be in prayers, and to this church. And I also want to grow in service for your kingdom and for this place, for this church, my brothers and sisters, my elders, and the lost ones. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit in us, for all your love has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. Lord Jesus, you know that we love you. So please help us love you more and show it with our commitment and service. In your name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Sorry. Thank you, Michael. So do I say this every time? That's your best one. I love it. I'm going to go home and listen to it again. I like it that much. Um, you know, Michael <clears throat> spoke about uh, our Easter service, and we, we decided to go out and put out flyers, uh, something that Michael has done in the past uh, very successfully. And, yeah, there was a little tinge of, oh, I don't know, you know. And it was great fun. You know, I went out with Gary, uh, spent some time with Michael, uh, Barry was out with us, and uh, it was very satisfying in the end. I felt like I did something that Jesus wants me to do, and that was just to say hello and invite somebody to my church. Um, Michael mentioned Steve uh, Benko. So we uh, heard from Steve this morning that he's doing well. He's in Arizona, and he hopes to return here in a few weeks. That's good. It's great to see Fred back with us. He was... First, a cold and pneumonia. How are you feeling now, Fred? A lot better. I'm almost over, and I, but the thing is, I'm almost out of my uh, antibiotics, so I'm going to go to the doctor next week to make sure. Okay. But I feel much, much better. We've been praying for you. Uh, those of you that know John and Dahlia Ornelius, um, John went through a triple bypass surgery this, this week. Uh, and he's done a remarkable job. He was kind of weak when he went in. They were afraid he wouldn't make it if they put it off until this week, uh, this coming week. And uh, he's already out of ICU. Uh, he's up. They have him walking around. They've got the tubes out. Uh, he's eating food. Uh, he's in pain still, kind of to be expected. Uh, but he's really felt our prayers. And uh, you may know Dahlia. Dahlia's got limited mobility, and she might need some meals. So if you're interested, think you can do something to provide a meal for Dahlia. It would just be a matter of preparing something and leaving it for her. Why don't you see Wendy Wilson, and she'll make a schedule um, and help you link up with Dahlia. Um, we heard from Darren Paulson, now how God works. You know, maybe a month ago, we asked Michael if he would be able to be here this Sunday. Then yesterday, Darren got kidney stones and was in the ER all day. Yeah, I, I can tell you, no, that's painful by the moans, yes. Um, but uh, he, he probably couldn't be here today, so that's how God works. Um, Matt Watson, you know, he still has heart issues, and he's uh, been working hard where he works at school. And uh, so he spent his time uh, recovering on Sundays. Helen Moore is still in the recovery center, mostly for a knee problem, I understand. Gary and Linda Heasel had both contracted COVID, uh, so they're home recuperating. Uh, Gary was feeling much better, and Linda, I think, is tagging along a little behind him. Um, I think that kind of brings us up to where we're at. 
Sue's still got back problems. We want to lift her up. Uh, if you're not getting the weekly church newsletter, you can see Barry. He's the one that keeps that uh, mailing list going. Um, if you would like to be on a daily prayer list, uh, we have that available as well. And uh, actually, Dahlia does that, and we can get you on that if you would like to see that. Uh, we're going to sing our closing song. It's called, uh, it's doxology. There's a lot of different doxology. This one's known as the Old 100th. Uh, they just happened to find a little background information on this this week. And uh, it was written because at that time, they didn't sing anything but psalms in church. Uh, and uh, this gentleman had a school for young men. And he wrote this song so they had something to sing in the morning when they woke up, when they go to bed in hallways. You know how the halls echo and kids like to sing songs? You know it well, I'm sure. Why don't you stand up as we close with doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. It's only four lines. Look how much it covers, how much God loves us, how omnipotent he is, and how our love should be for him. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, for this message, for this family of believers. Thank you for the Senti Church, Lord, that can come alongside of us uh, and be with us as brothers and sisters, Lord. Um, I ask that you bless them, bless Michael, bless us, Lord. Uh, that when we draw closer to you, we draw closer to all those that you love. Lord, and this is how it should be. I ask that you be with those that I mentioned that are under the weather, feeling bad, recovering from surgery, but also those that I missed, Lord, those that maybe didn't say anything. Marcia Shearcliffe, Lord, foot problem. There's so many. But you want to hear from us. Thank you, Lord, for that. You love us. Thank you, Lord, for that. You forgive us. Thank you, Lord, for that. You extend your grace to us. Undeserved grace, Lord. Thank you for that. Build us up this week. Allow us to, just one person maybe, give it that evangelistic message. Do you know God? Do you know his love for you. Do you have a church? We can do so much when we try. I ask for all this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you very much.